Dear friends in Christ, we pick up this week from the story of last week where there was a rich young man, ruler, who had come to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep the commandments. And he said, I've done these from my youth. And then he pointed out his idol. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then follow me, which is probably the key part of it, follow me. And it said, the man went away very sad. We look at this particular passage today, and we see Jesus now teaching his disciples. That was a very public uh, moment. You know, someone was seeking an audience with Jesus. And we find then that in the world that Jesus has broken into, it's upside down. Sin has twisted it. It is all the values of God are on the bottom and worldly values are on the top. And so Jesus then does a teaching that we also can learn from. He said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Well, what Jesus is striking at is a way of understanding or their view of how God interacts with his people or in the world in general. He is once again going to set right what's been turned upside down, and it is one that in Jesus' day people clearly felt that, that uh, if you had wealth, if you had means, you were favored by God. Now, not just blessed by God, okay? You were favored by God, which rises to pride, which says that you're favored over other people. It's a slippery slope of sin, and it begins with the general acceptance or understanding of that. And um, uh, as Jesus comes in and strikes that down by saying how hard it is for the rich to get into the kingdom of heaven, they're thinking, oh, we figured they were already in. The rest of us are working so hard. And Jesus says, no, that's not how it, it goes. That's not how God has set it up. And he even says that because riches create a false sense of security, of not needing God, a false sense of well-being that money can pretty much buy and take care of everything, which it can do a lot, but it still has its limitations as we look at people in, in uh, you know, certain situations. He gives one of his extreme examples. It is harder, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Boy, this really gets through to them saying, okay, we have to put things now in a new perspective. And this new perspective is what Jesus wants to have us continue to not only understand but live under. And then they say, well, who can be saved? And Jesus isn't, is teaching, used hyperbole, exaggeration. I mean, just to, to talk about it, you know, which I understand to be you know, a camel and an eye of a needle, small thing. Uh, then um, but God says, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God, which is true for everyone having access to God, everyone being able to be part of God's kingdom, which is also in their mind, in our mind too, the age to come has to do with the impossible that God has done. And you know what's impossible? to change our hearts, to really break through the hard-heartedness that we're born with, and to do really the impossible of what Jesus did on the cross. I mean, an innocent man giving up his life for all, he did the impossible, he accomplished it, and he did it out of great love for us. So we come where Jesus then, at the, at, as we take a look at our verse, then speaks of what this means. Because Peter says, we've left everything to follow you. Okay, so now what? We seem to have lost everything. And in Mark 10, uh, 29, it says, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields along with persecution. In the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last 
first. So we find that, um, uh, as we understand this, that God has sent Jesus into the world to set things up right. And in doing so, he first had to deal with the source of it all, the sin, by paying for that, destroying that, his body broken, that we would be whole, God giving his life back as we celebrate Easter every week, and for us to understand how God works. See, the truth is, is if you want to think that God favors those who have wealth or means, or even health, you know, whatever, well, what does that mean? You don't have God's favor when things aren't going so well? God doesn't work that way. You know, one of the great things about our being connected to Jesus and what he's done for us is that we always have God's favor. Always have God's favor. That's the message of grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. We always have God's favor. But not because somehow we've earned it, deserved it, or or do it, but because of what God has done for us. And part then of what he says is, the following me, because that was how we left off last week, was follow me, uh, we find that Jesus says, you're going to receive a hundredfold in this life and the age to come. But he also says, along with persecutions. We have to keep that in mind. See, if we're in the service of Jesus, if we're following Jesus, which means we're in the service of Jesus, then ultimately serving in his church and serving those around us, joining Jesus on his mission, the neighbors that God has placed in our world that we live in and amongst, that we find that the promise of God is both a blessing and suffering. It's both. And it's a reality of what God would say to us as we see again that sin upside makes everything upside down. The world is what skews and confuses our values. And once again, God would call us to reaffirm his values, which then are our values, and to see how the world turns it upside down. That Jesus was dealing in a world where even then there was a lot of corruption. See, what was the idol of the, of, the, of, of the leaders in the church of Jesus' day? It was their power. It was their status. See, that's worldly, right? Don't we have a lot of that going on? And there's a, a, new, a new report of corruption every day somehow in the news all across everything, right? doesn't matter where it's at. Those in, in position and, and power, and we see corruption, uh, valuing that more than valuing people and serving people. Jesus calls us to focus on service. And he promises you're going to be blessed a hundredfold. But don't forget, the path of Jesus is not so somehow you gain material wealth. We find that even today, uh, and for many, many decades, uh, or maybe even longer than that, that there are those who would hold out Christianity to people as a way to have all things come their way, right? Health, wealth, which somehow then is if it's not happening, all of a sudden, oh, I guess I don't have God's favor. I don't have enough faith. I'm not working hard enough. I'm not striving hard enough. And Jesus says, wait, wait. What you're asking for is impossible for you to do. You can't strive, work, attain it. I can give it to you. It comes by faith. And we do have God's favor. And you know, one of the most important ways to be reminded that we have God's favor and ties in with Jesus saying, you're going to receive a hundred times as much in the present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and all, is baptism. Being baptized is God's favor. You've been adopted into his family and made a full heir fully a part of God's family, a child of God, and brothers and sisters with each other and our brother Jesus. Baptism reminds us we have God's favor. In a lot of ways, infant baptism even emphasizes it that much more, which has really been a part of our church from the very first century, because it shows that it is an act of God, 
not the will or action of the baby, right? Now, it's important that if someone's been baptized, that they're taught the faith, that the faith is nurtured, and that nurturing comes through the word of God and the fellowship of the church. And then there's a time which um, we, we have, it's really exciting, we have our, our uh, nine uh, confirmation students. And uh, as I taught them last week, uh, just a, a great, great group of young people. Uh, again, commitment by their families to confirm the faith of their baptism and understanding then of what it means to be a child of God. So we find that uh, when Jesus comes in and says the last, first will be last and the last is first, he's really saying, we gotta tur- I've come to turn things upside right. Things have to be changed around. But we can't do it, but God can. And God can be doing it now. Restoring the world now by how we join Jesus on his mission, how we find a way to be a blessing to other people and for him to work in our lives and to be united around Jesus. And when the times, when there are blessings, and then there's times of suffering or persecutions, when we're in the service of Jesus and we're following him, we have his favor. We have his favor. And everything's okay. He can see the past, the present, and the future. This is our walk of faith. This is how God has called us to live for him. And he does teach us through his entire word. Interesting that passage from Ecclesiastes uh, about wealth, right? Other passages about what God values. And for us to live a life that values those things. As much as God values us that Jesus came and did the impossible on the cross. It is still... Think about it. A sacrifice of a person for the sake of all? Wow. We have received God's favor, God's gift of love, his grace, and he then calls us to join him on his mission and to live that out before us. Once again, focusing on service, putting God's values first, because he has given us that value. May we continue to understand fully under all times and circumstances that we have God's favor. Jesus, our true treasure, our all and all. Love the, that last um, part of the hymn. My Jesus is my treasure, my life, my health, my wealth, my friend, my love, my pleasure. My joy, my crown, my all, my bliss eternally. What is the world to me when you have Jesus? In his name we pray. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.